I have a question for you, sir. Do you want to go for another half hour? Sure, why not? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Wow, we just flew right through this. Time flies when you're having fun. Are you having fun? I never think in terms of fun. <laughs> and I, I, never, I never think in terms of happiness. <laughs> <laughs> well, when does time fly for you? What leads? Uh, did it seem like an hour or is that? It did not. It did not. No. Well, that, that's an interesting thing you so just brought So what emotion up. are you having then? Do you have emotions at all? <sighs> Probably, but I mean, I'd be attaching a word to it, right? Oh, well, there we go. See? See. And I, I got to talk about that, by the way. <laughs> I've got to talk about this thing about the importance of words. I, are, are you I love familiar that. with the Buffalo Zen community? Uh, no. If ever there was a, uh, a worldview that that downplayed the importance of concepts and words and and extolled experience, it's the Buffalo Zen community. Every year for the past five years, they have had a Zen master from somewhere else in the country. I don't know who. His name is Conrad Rushin. He would come to Buffalo. And then we'd get contacted by the Buffalo Zen community, uh, the Buffalo Zen Center. They'd say, Conrad Ruchin is coming here for a three-day seminar. Do you think you could record it and put it all on Think Twice Radio? And we would say, sure. And then somebody would go down there, they would record all the, all the lectures, put it on Think Twice Radio, get thousands and thousands of hits, because people from across the whole world were interested in what he had to say, right? Last year, no invite to come and record him. So we called them. We said, usually Conrad Ruchin comes this time of year. And they said, it won't be Conrad Ruchin this year. It's going to be somebody else, and they don't want to be recorded. I said, all right, so that's that. Then I asked somebody I knew who was in the Buffalo Zen Center, and I said, why no Conrad Ruchin? And I said, you didn't hear about that, did you? They said, go on the Internet <laughs> and look at this... Uh, a uh, group, uh, you know, where people talk to each other. I forgot what that's called. But uh, you'll find out more about why he's not welcome. Conrad Ruchin was, it was revealed that he was cheating on his wife. He was married and he had a student that he had developed an affair with, sexual affair. And when it was discovered, he, he made it public because he, he knew, <laughs> I don't know if, if it was a wise thing, you know, like, like sooner or later it's going to come out, you know, so, and they're already on to me. So he made it public and he, he tried to do damage control and he said, yes, she was my student and we fell in love and I don't even know how he tried to spin his way out of that thing, that it was the right thing or the wrong thing to do. But I was just thinking about this last night on my night walk. I think a lot of what happened to him is the fact that he has spent so much of his life telling people not to do a lot of thinking, not to use language, not to do a lot of analysis. I think if he had done more of that, he would have reflected on himself as to whether or not he was doing the right thing or wrong thing. <laughs> well, let me... Uh... <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me uh, offer a counter suggestion. Um, would the type of reflection you're suggesting be needed if a person had uh, developed um, a set of basic uh, uh, morals? And let's leave out morals and use the word values or guides. Um, so that it becomes, uh, I don't need to reflect on this. This is just the wrong thing to do. You know, I, and, and the other way to say it is that he's encountering, uh, you know, let's look at, break it apart. There's maybe uh, uh, um, negativity within his relationship or dormancy within his relationship with his wife and attraction, uh, newness and freshness and, and maybe secrecy, uh, which we'll leave off to the side, but uh, newness, freshness, uh, um, uh, affection, um, attention, all on the side of this young woman. Um, so if, if he had an openness in his, in his line of uh, values that he says, you know, we're having challenges and I'm in 
engaged with this young woman who's given me a lot of attention and it's attractive to me. What do you think? Um, and what the wife would say is, it would be something that he would either follow or make a decision that maybe we should end this relationship and I'll, and I'll go from there. Um, but to, you know, and it reminds me of another story I heard recently of a, of a woman who was in a relationship with someone who um, <laughs> um, hid the fact that he was in, engaged with someone. And I don't know if it was a married, but it was a, it was a deep, long-term committed relationship. But then when she learned about it, she learned secondhand that it was an open relationship. So this, this fellow actually had the open ticket to do whatever he wanted in the openness of his relationship, and he didn't. He still did it as a, a secret affair. He could have told her. He could have told her. And it wouldn't have violated any rules because they agreed to that. But he also need, he, I, I, I'm thinking back now, he probably um, believed that if he told the new woman that this was the case, she probably wouldn't have done it. So that's probably why he did it. Hmm. Um, but still, uh, that point of uh, adopting a principle of uh, openness and honesty, I wonder if he would have needed to have that, what you suggested, of uh, the need to pause and reflect. Hmm. Well, lately when people have been asking me, uh, are you an atheist? I say, well, I'm... I'm at a step beyond atheism, because I think there's something more important than the concept of God. And they say, what is that? And I say, the concept of right and wrong. I said, that takes precedence over everything. So when you, when you look at the story in the Bible, where they said to Abraham, take your son, go up the mountain and kill him. Didn't it occur to Abraham to say, that's the wrong thing to be asking me? How dare you? But you see, in the Bible, it's God comes first, not right and wrong. And I take the opposite position. I say right and wrong comes first before everything else. Yeah. Well, and, and that's what makes uh, this world a world, that uh, your right might be someone else's wrong or might be someone else's uh, neutral. Oh, it, um, oh so that, well, that would be like moral relativism. Sure. And... Uh, um, I actually agree with that. I don't think you do. I don't think you do. Because then Conrad Ruschen could say, well, I didn't do anything wrong. He would say, uh, you know, if I look upon it as right, it is right. And, and I would say you as Conrad Ruschen has made that choice. I as uh, Tony Bellani don't agree with you. And if I were in that Buffalo Zen group, I would have said, probably did what they did. And said, Conrad Ruschen is uh, not welcome because we have, uh, we're not going to be morally relative to Conrad Ruschen. We're going to be morally relative to our morals. Hmm. So that's, that's what I mean by um, uh, um, someone having this sense of right. Because how, how can you uh, project your sense of right and wrong on someone else? Well, it's sort of like this. In Sparta, 300, 400 B.C., they had a custom that you, we only want strong warriors to be Spartans. We don't want anyone to grow up here who's not of that. So they said, it is incumbent upon all parents within a few weeks after the child is born to take the baby, wrap him up, and leave him on the mountainside for two days. If they come back in two days and he's still alive, he's a Spartan. I bet that there were mothers living in Sparta who said, this is the wrong thing to do. And I bet some of them even <clears throat> said, we're just going to say we did it and not do it. Because I think there's a universal sense of right and wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not fully on board with that. <laughs> okay. I, I, but I... Um, I have uh, values that I think uh, are impenetrable, you know, uh, murder and torture and uh, um, uh, different levels of injustice. Um, but my sense of injustice may be different from your sense of injustice. And uh, um, maybe that's why I've gotten along with so many people, because I don't really uh, talk morals to people. Mm. And that's, I just act. And that's the other principle that I followed in 
in uh, leading people in and out of the artists and models is that uh, you either are going to do what you said you're going to do or you're not. And if you're not, I'd rather know sooner than later so that we can continue to be friends. Mm. You were my friend before this, or I knew of you, and I'd rather continue to hold that view that I had rather than think, like, what a loser, what a, what a, a deadbeat. Uh, and I really think... Uh, that a uh, very little, very few people, because uh, my my response is, I guess I'll just have less to do with that person, hmm. or I'll always be able to say hi to that person, um, but I really don't think I could call that person in a time of need, hmm. you know. But there are other people that I've nurtured and cultivated, um, and that I call my friends that I know I can pick up the phone and say, Hey, can you help me move a couch? Hmm. You know, do you have a truck I could borrow? Do you know someone else? And there was, I just was part of something, and I'd love for your input on this. This was very interesting, mm. and it dovetails with our conversation. There's a, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, a structuralized uh, version of, of uh, altruism that mm. I just was part of yesterday, and it's called the uh, reciprocity ring. Mm. And it's uh, becoming kind of popular in, in business worlds and as a sort of exercise or a game or what have you to sort of say, um, we need to pay more attention to each other. We need to find uh, ways to uh, use the people under our own umbrella of our organization in different departments, break down the silos, et cetera, et cetera. So what they do is, uh, uh, in, in our case, they got around 20 people together in a circle, and they had a big chart that was a circle mm -hmm. um, in front of us. And everybody took a few minutes and wrote on a sheet of paper their name and something they would like done. And it could be anything. And the guy said, no, nothing R-rated. We're not a dating service. So let's just stick to um, getting your house painted, moving a couch, uh, learning a skill, um, finding uh, something you haven't been able to find. And we put it up there one after the other and everyone announced it and while people were saying what they were saying they had another sheet of paper where you put uh, your name on and if you could help that person you could write down um, the way you could help that person mm -hmm. so after we went through the whole circle of what everyone personally needed one thing you went back through the circle and everyone's saying well for uh, the person that's looking for a car, I know a great car dealer who sells uh, reliable used cars at low prices, uh, call them up. Or a person that uh, was looking to be more organized, say, I, I do that all the time, and I'll, I'll coach you through it. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking for ways to remember people's names. Someone said, I know someone that's developing a foolproof process, and I'll give you that person's name. So in, in, in uh, the course of uh, 40 minutes, 20 people found uh, at least two things, two leads on getting a, a, a little problem in their life solved. Hmm. Well, you know, that ties into something that... And no one was asking for anything in return. And that ties into something that happened uh, with me recently. My friend went to a place called Buffalo Reuse. Oh, yeah, I know that. I love in it. In other words, if a building's being torn down, they go there and they say, oh, someone will want this, someone will want this, and they put it all in this big warehouse. Then you can go there and you can buy things that they got for free, but you're getting like a, a door for $2 or something, right? She was just overwhelmed by what a fantastic place this is. If you're, if you're not a picky person, in other words, like, you know, you don't care if something has a ding in it or whatever, but you just want a desk, let's say. She said to the person at the front desk, um, she said, could you tell me if you have any um, Formica counters? He said, we think, I think there might be some in room two, but you might want to check room five and maybe room six. So anyway, she had to do a lot of hunting and she found what she was looking for. And then she went back up to the same person and she said, have you ever thought of having an inventory of everything you have on a computer. And so when I would have said to you, do you have any Formica countertops? You type in the word Formica countertop and up comes everything that you have. And the reason that she said this is that's what she does for a living. She sets up databases for people. And so he said, well, we just never had anybody who could do that. And she said, 
I would be willing to volunteer to do that for you because I really <laughs> believe in what you're doing. It ties into what you're saying. She is being altruistic about something that she herself likes doing. Well, uh, and this ties in with me. And there you are. Yeah, because you are. I'm altruistic using the things that I like doing. So for, for their wedding, I like taking pictures. So I'm being altruistic about taking all the pictures. But in a way, I'm doing what I like to do. And it ties into the reciprocity ring that you spoke about. So uh, let, let's get the brass tax question, or, uh, <laughs> tax, tax, out of the way. And so obviously uh, you uh, live uh, here mm -hmm. um, and you have a means of support. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it doesn't, uh, do you go to, do you work a day job somewhere? I do, I do. Uh, in, uh, when I, um, uh, let's see, what year would this be? 1972, I was in the job market. And I went to a, you know, uh, the want ads. And it said, legal messenger. And I said, oh, this sounds interesting, I can do that. So I went to a place and I applied for the job and he said, we are not a law firm. He said, we sell our services to law firms. And he said, uh, if you come here, you will learn more than just being a messenger. He says, because we do a lot of work for them in the courts as well. So I, I got the job. And after four years, uh, I was managing the place. <laughs> And then I said to the person who owned the business, you don't know about any of this, do you? I, I know that we've been to a place called Buffalo Paralegal, and uh, <laughs> there's this. After four years, I said to the owner, I could really run this business better than you. <laughs> I said, I have a lot of innovative ideas that I could incorporate, and I could really, I could really do a better job. He said... Thank you for that information. He said, I'll, I'll give that some consideration. Two weeks later, he said, we won't be needing your services anymore. <laughs> that same day when I went home, I said, this is a sign. It's time for me to start my own business and go into competition with him. So that was 1976, the same year I moved into this house. In 1991, he approached me and said, would you be willing to buy what's left of my business? <laughs> <laughs> that was a very satisfying day. <laughs> that uh -huh. occupation has been my source of income. And I think it's important that you ask that because economics is the foundation of all consciousness. So in other words, and M. Faust is the one who pointed this out to me. He said, oh, look, there's going to be a, a film at Hall Walls on uh, Gertrude Stein. And, and I said, you're going to go see it? And he said, yes. And then I saw him after that. I said, how was that film? And he said, it was never mentioned in the whole film how she, how she paid to make her art. Like, what was her, what was her foundation, you know? And I said, M, you and I think alike, because I think the exact same way. you got to know who is paying the bills underneath it all. Well, and, and uh, uh, it, that's another reason that people in business don't value art other than uh, Picasso. And, uh, um, you know, and they value it because another market said that Picasso is worth $60 million and uh, Andy Warhol is worth 12 and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, you... This, these are the people that I uh, crave to meet, uh, and I've known all my life that they've made. And, you know, one of the uh, subjects I want uh, downstream, and I've been talking to them, is Greg and Paula. You know, that they've made the life that they're living um, as artists and also made a life for themselves. Whereas business people think, you know, they have that goofy, uh, offbeat cinema, romanticized view of artists, you know, uh, living in, in, in uh, squalor and uh, either drunk or drinking coffee or uh, whatever. And, um, you know, the, the muse hits them and uh, they just frenzied work of art and then they go back to, uh, you know, but most artists I know are responsible people. And, uh, you know, uh, 
Um, they, they're contributors uh, to society in, in lots of different ways. And they just, you know, that's the other thing that um, um, I talk to people about in business that want to make a change. I say, if you really want to do this thing that you're talking about and, and change, and like, even if it's getting better in your existing job, you have to accept that in addition to the 40, 50, or whatever hours you put in at work, you're going to take on more hours in your week. Are you ready to do that? That's a baseline question I ask these people. And I said, because I'm not going to be the one doing the work. I'm just going to point you in the direction of the work that you really ought to be doing. But, and so here you are. Um, how many hours a week does your business consume for you? At present, I would say 20 because I'm semi-retired now. You've, you've built a very good uh, situation. You know, but some, uh, you hear of uh, some artists that they break out of their day job and go to work on their art. Uh, um, and then there's other artists that are perennially um, in the middle that they're finding, um, you know, small, low paying jobs uh, and breaking out as soon as they can to uh, pursue their passion of art. And I don't begrudge anyone uh, at all. Um, and and I, what, who I do begrudge is the business people the people, the non-art people that uh, think that because they're not being a 40-hour-a-weeker, they're slackers. Um, I think there should be value, um, and I don't know if uh, endowments of the arts to support that. I think there needs to be some of that um, because uh, the, the true value of, of a work of art is, like I said earlier, undervalued in this society. So there needs to be some level of subsidy to allow the art to keep coming. Um, and, and in the same breath, I say that um, it's rare for a true artist to ever be put down to not make art. A true artist will make art no matter what, in the worst circumstances. And as we saw, you know, uh, artists in prison use uh, um, stones to scrape into stone to make uh, representations of what they're thinking and what they're trying to say to people. Uh, um, but the, the, the point is, is that uh, um, you, found a, you found a way to, uh, um, um, and there's some imbalance in that compared to uh, the greater uh, uh, type of society, and you've made it a balance. And there's, uh, um, there's value in, in what you're doing for your life. And, and I made the same decision when I, we started out saying, I'm going from theory to action. And I put extra hours in every week, you know, in addition to my day job to uh, do this kind of stuff. I'm sitting here tonight instead of sitting home uh, doing something else. Uh, I have a question for you, and I, I got to get your opinion on this. Uh, uh, Nordstrom released a new product in their product line, jeans <laughs> that have fake dirt on them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that means somebody, some <clears throat> artist had to design that and come up with the proper material that when you washed it, it looked still like they were dirty after they were washed. Uh, what are your thoughts on art being so subservient to what I call capitalism? Um, I mean, hasn't, hasn't the ideas of capitalism in a way polluted a lot of art? Sure. And uh, you can just ignore it. What's, you know, uh, and that's, I think that's another problem of, uh, of the flow, the constant flow of the Internet, is that uh, um, some things, you, 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 you know, by choosing to go on Facebook or choosing to go on some feed somewhere, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot you just can't ignore. And, you, you know, I, that I even know what you're talking about is because I saw it flow through something. You know, I, I um, suck up news headlines, and then whatever is interesting to me, I'll, I'll dive in or I'll save it for later. Um, I'm always looking for ideas that make me think of uh, new ways to talk about uh, this type of leadership that I've been uh, sharing with you. Um, I, I really can't pass judgment on it, honestly. Hmm. Um, I really can't, uh, um, you know, like... But then on the same token, I can say something about the, uh, um, 
I guess I can't either. You know, there's the Pepsi commercial that I think was a travesty. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but it's more of a comedy of errors than anything. That it's uh, that a group of, uh, <laughs> and I think Saturday Night Live did a parody of what that might have been like, what the creative conversation might have been like around making that Pepsi commercial. And I just think it's just a bunch of um, stupid elitist people. They go, oh, well, you know, and um, shouldn't the protesters look a little better than they do? And, um, you know, and um, sh let's, let's get some makeup in for that one. And, you know, the people that really protest, we know them. We know, you know, people that do that, and they don't really think about how they look when they're out there. And they're doing it in all kinds of weather. Uh, they're not doing it with the beautiful sunlight uh, rippling down on their faces. Um, and they're doing it for a purpose. They're not, you know, and to, tr to transpose that, um, it hit a nerve. But uh, at the same time, I realized that uh, it's just Pepsi, you know, and I really don't pay attention to uh, um, ads other than um, if, the, if there's a creative conversation to be had around the making of it, uh, then I'll, I'll you know, here's, here's a good example. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg, and it made the cover of uh, Fast Company this month, um, released the longest post in the history of Facebook for him, um, almost 6,000 words, and it made, it made some ripple in the news feeds, and I picked it up. And I ended up in my blog uh, um, talking about, uh, the, the headline of the article was uh, um, uh, Trump and Zuck, uh, and Trump, Zuck, and the Internet. Uh, um, you know, uh, I forget what words I used after that. Uh, but, you know, and, and Zuckerberg keeps talking about the Internet as a force for good. Um, while he completely ignored the role Facebook played in the, in the uh, nine, you know, 15 months of the election, the bruising election. Said nothing about it and just saying, well, I think we could make people see more of each other's views if we sneak more stuff into their feed that um, they don't really want to see. And I'm thinking like, no. I mean, what do you think of that statement? Uh, I often wonder if his motivation is to get more advertisers or if his motivation is to uh, enhance the quality of life in America? Um, I, I tend to think it's the first because, uh, you know, the, the method that he's talking about it is that we would be clicking more uh, buttons about ourselves, so it would give his advertisers even more um, granular sorting of who we are and what we're like. Mm. Um, and, you know, my personal experience over the course of this election, and this is what I wrote about, and, and I pulled a great article from NPR about it, um, is that uh, um, when some of my uh, um, red state friends posted, it didn't change any blue state friends um, to think like, I, 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 maybe I should think more like this person. And my red state friends uh, would, would ridicule some of my blue state friends for this, that, or the other thing. Um, so I don't think... It, I think Mark Zuckerberg is, you know, what I ended up saying, I said, if he really wants to help people, why doesn't he um, use the, the new concept of crowdsourcing to solve problems? I mean, he's got a billion people. So let's ask a billion people um, what we can do for hunger. See what that, see what response is. And then I said that if you really want to use your, the sorting of your, uh, you know, your brilliant algorithms at Facebook, you'll know how to sort out the idiots, the trolls, and the ultra-left and the ultra-right um, on the site and find some happy medium out of a billion answers. You know, and even, let's just say, okay, you don't get, um, um, you don't get a billion answers, you get 10% of, okay, so we'll settle for 100 million answers. Do you think we can get some trending out of that? And even if you sort out because that's the other thing is uh, a lot of people said in the election, one of the forces that led to Donald Trump winning was, uh, I, I forget the name of this, this group of like purposeful um, uh, um, world screwer uppers, purposeful trolls. And I forget the name of the group. I could look it up and share it with you. But they're going, yeah, this, this really, uh, I want everything to suck. So they think like electing Trump is like making everything suck. And they're the, one, they're the ones that were behind um, 
um, going after the women uh, gamer uh, coders. Right, 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 right. You know, or yeah. that they're the ones that rush to, um, you know, uh, shaming someone and ruining their life for the rest of their life because um, someone did something embarrassing and they're going to make it the worst thing that they ever did in their life. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's that whole culture on the Internet, too. So you can't immediately assume that everyone's going to just answer questions in the good, in the honest, in the genuine. But I'm thinking that if there's anyone in the world that could figure that out, it's going to be Zuckerberg and his people. Mm. They're going to be able to go, that's an asshole answer. That's a genuine answer. That's an ultra right wing answer. That's an ultra left wing answer. We're going to filter it down and say, you know, um, here's a pretty broad range of answers, but we filtered out the, um, you know, the idiotville stuff and the uh, tin hat stuff. And wow, here's some pretty cool ideas about hunger. Go and hand it to the World Health Organization and hand it to uh, um, um, UNICEF and so on and so forth. Yeah, you, you raise, I, I think, a very interesting point in that. Should we say goodbye to the people? <laughs> I think so. I think this has been great. Very exciting. And, uh, you know, I don't know that anyone's ever done any uh, biography work on you, Richard, so I'm, this may be a bit of a first as well. You're always welcome to come back. <laughs>